Anita, thank you for doing your Southeast Johnson County history presentation for us. And we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Laurie. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Well, I hope uh, everybody, thank, first of all, thank you for coming. I really appreciate your attendance. And I hope uh, many of you were able to attend Lori and Jonathan and uh, Dick's presentation yesterday on urban murals. It was just fantastic. And I think it was um, recorded so you can pull it up if, in case you missed it. So I'm hoping uh, this presentation will be half as good and I will have then uh, achieved uh, my goal. But uh, let's start with uh, just, um, I, uh, Debbie and uh, Lori sent out, I think a copy of this PowerPoint. Uh, it is uh, 34 slides. And I don't know if you received it or not, but it doesn't make any difference. We'll just walk through it. Um, anybody have any questions on that? Okay, All right. Um, so uh, what, uh, what we're gonna talk about today is Southeast Johnson County uh, history. And basically what we're talking about are four areas. Stanley Morris is one area, and I still call it Stanley, even though it, and Morris, even though they've been incorporated into Overland Park, and then Aubrey Stillwell area. And Aubrey is now part of Stillwell. So really it is Overland Park and Stillwell that we're talking about today. And you'll notice that the uh, date on this is 2005. Well, I have a disclosure to make to you. And that is that um, this is really the third book. And so um, the first book I wrote on this history was written in 1978, if you can imagine that long ago. And um, it was called the uh, Stanley, uh, the settlement of the Stanley area. And I was teaching at uh, Blue Valley High School at that time, and I was teaching American history. And I thought it would be really neat to pull the community of the history together to help the students better relate to American history. And then in 1980, we did another book on the community of Aubrey Stillwell. And so each book stood by itself. And um, we used them in our American history course. And again, it was to um, understand our own community history and how it related to what was going on in the settlement of the United States. And then I would do that uh, the first semester and then the second semester we'd go more into study of genealogy, which was our own family history. And again, trying to uh, relate it to American history. Well, in 2005, I had this brainstorm that it would be really neat to put both those books together and to do it on a sabbatical, and then to go from 1978 to 2005 and update what had gone on during that time. So that's what this book is here, okay? This says 2005. It's basically putting the first two books together because so much of it is the same. The first two parts is on Native American history, and it's the same for both areas. The second part is on Civil War, which is the same history, just uh, exactly. And then the third part of the 2005 book is on just Stanley. And then um, the next part is just on Aubrey Stillwell. And then the last part is on this new part, 1978 to 2005. Now, what I'm um, going to focus on today is we're going to take about 20 minutes here to talk about the Native American history and the Civil War history of these two areas. And then the last part, I will talk about the Stanley Morris, its unique history, and the Aubrey Stillwell, its unique history. And then we'll have at least 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, now, I have my name on this book, and um, there should be about, and I, I'm not exaggerating, about uh, 85 other names on this book. Because what happened was, we interviewed, and I was counting them last night, we interviewed 23 people from the Stanley Morse area in order to recall the history of the area and uh, some of them, and it's just wonderful, um, their grandmother, these were students of mine, their grandmother's grandmother 
was one of the original founders of Stanley. And she wrote a diary and that's in this book and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what we did was we interviewed these people, uh, a number from Stanley and Stillwell, and then we interviewed like um, another 33 from Stillwell Albury. And those are just wonderful, wonderful interviews. And I got smarter as I was doing the second project on Stillwell and Albury. And I decided why not have the students do the interviews, not just me. So we had about 12 students that volunteered and they would go and make appointments and talk to these folks that had very deep roots in Albury Stillwell. And I would say to them, just take a recorder and um, just start asking questions. And of course, everybody, nobody wants to be recorded. And I said, what you say is, just let me put the recorder down and let me turn it on. And if it bothers you, just we'll turn it off. Well, it never happens that they want to turn it off because they get so gross about talking about their family and their community and their history. And those are just wonderful, wonderful interviews. And um, so, those people, all those people, and uh, it almost brings tears to my eyes. I knew them personally. Those people from Stanley and Morris that we interviewed, and also, <coughs> excuse me, the people from Aubrey and Stillwell, uh, they became like family members. And, you know, I'd see them at basketball games, I'd see them at baseball games um, at uh, Blue Valley High School. And they were just so proud of these books because they were really the authors of it. Uh, so that's why I say this book is, you know, I have my name on it, but there should be so many more. The interviews are just key to the um, content, the content of this book. The second thing that is really key are the pictures. The pictures are magnificent. And I didn't go through last night to, to count them, but there must be a hundred pictures in this. And these pictures are dating way back to uh, almost the beginning of this time. And the person that took those pictures uh, were, were my, was my husband, Paul. And there was um, a person in Stanley, his name was Herschel Dugan, and he had so many pictures of Stanley and Aubrey. And he was so possessive of those uh, um, pictures. He would not let them out of his sight. And so Paul would go to his house and take the pictures with Herschel standing about one foot away from him. And then the other person, it was this wonderful woman from uh, Aubrey Stillwell, uh, Rada uh, Cox, and she had just this mountain of pictures and she wasn't as possessive and she would let me take them home and then Paul would take them. But the book is worth its weight in gold just for those pictures. And I hate to admit to them, but I, have lost those pictures and they will never be recovered. As people who read the books go, where are the original pictures? And I go, I don't know. Somewhere they got lost and I take total blame for it. But the book is just invaluable with those pictures. So if you look at this uh, cover store and cover right here, you'll see there's six pictures there and they're in the book and they're much clearer than uh, they are here. But the uh, one on the upper left is of the uh, drugstore in Stanley. The one right below it is the Hotel of Stanley. And then in the upper uh, right is the church and that's Wea in um, Miami County. And then underneath that is one of the train stations that's Stanley. And then at the bottom left is the O'Keefe family which is one of the founders of Stillwell. And then that wonderful picture of farm machinery on the far um, uh, left. But if you do nothing but um, look at the pictures of this book, it's, and, and I'm not bragging, but I, I know historical worth. It's just incredible. Okay, moving to the next one. So I don't know if any of you are from this area, Southern Johnson County. And if you are, I, I wanna hear from you um, as soon as we finish and add or subtract to what I say. But what basically we're talking about here is 151st and 69 Highway. That's the Stanley area, all right? And then if you go five miles west on 151st, you run into the little village of Morris, 151st and Quivira, okay? <laughs> and those two settlements 
were settled at the same time, which is right after the Civil War in, in 1866. Now, if you go five miles south on 69, you run into the two communities of Aubrey Stillwell. Interesting enough, Aubrey was uh, founded before the Civil War in 1858. 1858. Well, Civil War, of course, started in 1960, uh, pardon me, in 1861. And then Stillwell, because they put, they wanted to put a train running north and south, the Missouri Pacific, they moved the, um, the tracks, they put the tracks about half a mile uh, east of Aubrey, and then they combined those two communities together, and it's now referred to just as uh, Stillwell. And that was founded in 1885. So it's quite a bit after the Civil War. Okay, all right. Now let's go to um, the American Indian part. And we're gonna combine this with the Civil War and then we'll talk more specifically about those wonderful two areas. Whenever you talk about Native American Indians, you need to talk about two different groups. And those of us that uh, were at the Lewis and Clark presentation, we talk about the Native American Indians, those that have been here for thousands of years. And those are the Kansas people and they're the Osage people and they're the pa uh, Pawnee tribe, okay? They're the ones that uh, we're not sure when, but uh, we think came from Asian descent crossing the Bering Strait and going down as many as 10,000 years ago, okay? They settled in Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, all over this wonderful country of ours, the United States. And they're referred to as the natives, the first immigrants, the people that were here before any of us uh, ever came. And um, in 1825, 1825, there was a treaty signed that the people that were living in this area, as well as uh, a lot of the Native Americans west of the Mississippi River, needed to be, move further west, needed to move further west and south to Oklahoma to make room for the immigrant Indians, the Indians that were east of the Mississippi River. So we had a domino effect. And um, let's uh, just look at that a minute. Okay, so these immigrant Indians, the second ones, they lived east of the Mississippi and the Shawnee Indians that settled this area in uh, the 1830s, they're the ones who came from the east and came, came to the west. They were forced here by this um, Indian Removal Act of 1830, okay. And uh, what was going on is we uh, had a lot of people coming to the United States from the East Coast, the Europeans and, and other people, and it was getting too crowded. And we had the Native Americans living there and we had um, the uh, European white settlers, our colonists uh, settling there. And uh, so we decided, we, the government, um, in 1830 under Andrew Jackson decided that we needed to move all those thousands of Native Americans, force them to move west of the Mississippi, to leave their native, their heritage, the country that they had uh, lived in for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, that's how the Shawnees get here. And if you look at the uh, next uh, slide here, the Shawnees that settled in the Stanley Stillwell area, uh, before they were forced to come to this area, they were living in these states that have uh, slashes through them. And um, their main home, their main camp, their main reservation was in the Ohio Valley. And um, let me just say a couple of things about uh, Native Americans, and we could talk about this forever, but um, they, um, when we, fought, when we started this country and our first president, George Washington, uh, there was always, an, and we refer to it as the Indian problem, the Indian problem. The folks that were here first were a problem to us. We didn't know what to do with them. I mean, should we coexist? Should we civilize them? 
civilized, and that word is a very specific word, means we make them more English. They speak English, they have our traditions, our American traditions in food and culture and education, and we Christianize them. And uh, there was that. Uh, do we conquer them? Um, do we remove them? Uh, what do we do with these folks? Uh, can we coexist and, and is there room for all of us? And uh, we eventually end up deciding that we need to remove them. And that's what happened uh, with the 1830 uh, Act. Jefferson, our third president, and, and um, uh, George Washington was very much uh, for coexistence. You know, there's room for all of us. Uh, and that's before we had you know, more and more uh, uh, migration. Um, it's the key person, the two key persons in this removal thing is, is um, Thomas Jefferson, our third president, and then our seventh president, Andrew Jackson. And you can remember them, at least I do, because their names both begin with J. And um, Andrew J or, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, he was for removal. And he said, let's, um, Let's uh, have them, you know, go to west, you know, west of the Mississippi. And he was the one who had the idea, but he never implemented it. And it was only Andrew Jackson in 1830 that said, we've got to move these folks somewhere else. The Native Americans are unique and beautiful and wonderful in their own culture, as we all know. Their spirituality is one of um, nature and the cosmos, and we're all part of this wonderful world of ours. They never understood the white person's concept of we buy and sell land. That was so foreign to them. We don't buy and sell land. We live in the land. We're part of the land. And I, I just read a beautiful poem the other day, and it was written by a Native American, and it says, we, um, it, it talks about the buffalo and how the buffalo is so important to us and we are to them. And it refers to the buffalo as our brother buffalo. And I thought, wow, what, is, what a concept to have, you know, that that buffalo provided them with shelter with their hides and food with uh, their meat and uh, you, you just are like, that isn't, we don't look, we look at it as not all part of one beautiful whole. And they really struggled with that, that whole concept of owning and buying land and signing treaties and, and signing property agreements. Okay, now um, looking at this then, um, uh, let's go to the next one, okay. The great leader of the Shawnees in Ohio was uh, Chief Tecumseh, and he wanted to get all the Native Americans that lived in that area to join together in a loose confederation. And a, use, a confederation means that you keep your own unique um, identity, your own tribe, but uh, we agree on certain things. It was twice in the United States we have tried to do a confederation and, and it has failed in both sense. The Articles of Confederation, which presupposed our, or predated our constitution, was, um, you know, the 13 colonies were unique and they were individual and they ran themselves. But uh, in time of war, they would contribute troops and, and, and help in the fighting but they were really their own boss. And that's what uh, Tecumseh tried to do. And the second time we had tried to have a confederation, of course, was the Confederate States of America, the uh, Southern states that wanted to be their own unique self and have slaves if they wanted to have slaves and nobody was gonna tell them otherwise. Um, unfortunately, Tecumseh failed in this concept. And the Native Americans said, no, we're just, you know, we've got all our tribes there, and they refer to themselves as nations, the Shawnee Nation, the Potawatomi Nation. They stand on their own. They have their own language. They have their own variation of their spirituality. They have their own educational system. They have their own government system. So to come so um, was so upset with this European 
a white European attitude towards the Native Americans of, you know, get out of our way, get, move on. Uh, we, we really, um, you're just uh, a pain in our neck. And um, so when the War of 1812 broke out, he decided to fight on the side of the British. And so what he does is he and 300 of his warriors go to Canada, fight on the side of the British against Americans. And um, he unfortunately is killed during that war. At that same time that that happened, the famous Tippecanoe uh, battle occurred, which was in the Ohio Valley and he wasn't there. And they did um, destroyed a lot of the Shawnees that were living there because their chief, their warrior, uh, was uh, involved in the War of 1812. And um, he, it was actually the Battle of Ontario that uh, Tecumseh dies. Okay, moving to the next one. So the famous act where we take these Shawnees and hundreds and hundreds of American Indians, and let me, let me make a comment on what do you call these folks? Are they American Indians? Are they Native Americans? Are they first immigrants? And, and so what do I do when I talk to these Native Americans? And I've talked to many of them that uh, there's still um, some reservations in the Kansas area that we'll refer to. And I say, what, I, I don't wanna insult you, but what, what do I call you? And they say, you call me Thomas. I am a member of the tribe of the Pawnee. They identify themselves by their tribe. Their tribe is their nation, okay? And they go, if you wanna call us American Indians, you wanna call us first, do what you want, but we identify ourselves by our nation, our tribe, okay? Now, going back to this 1830 to 1845 period, this 15 years period is this idea of uh, Jefferson not only became an idea, but a reality under President Jackson, who was president for eight years. And he forced these um, Native Americans to move west of the Mississippi. Now, west of the Mississippi is part of the Louisiana Purchase that was bought by Thomas Jefferson in 1803. And then we have Lewis and Clark explore this area and trying to find a waterway to the Pacific. And if you recall, they refer to much of this land, Kansas, Missouri, um, uh, um, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, as the Great Desert. So why not force these Native Americans to go to the Great Desert and, and try, we hope, to make a living and, and good luck by doing it, okay? And um, so it was west of the Mississippi and that's how the Shawnees uh, get to this uh, area, okay? Now, when they come to this area um, and they settled in the Stanley area, the Stillwell area, uh, their great chief was Chief Black Bob. And, um, and that's why we see the name Black Bob um, throughout Johnson County. You know, John, uh, Black Bob uh, Street, Black Bob um, uh, Schools. And I, I'm always intrigued by the story. And I, some of you have heard me say it that um, I have a sister and, and we, she was visiting. And so we're on uh, Black Bob Street and she notices the name of the street. And she said, what an awful name to have, Black Bob. I mean, it's like calling me White Anita or <laughs> Yellow Mary or something, you know? And, and I said, oh, Kath, you do not understand. That is an honor. Black Bob is the name of one of the greatest Shawnee chiefs that ever lived and lived in this area. So we're playing tribute to him. And she goes, oh, okay, I got it. All right, all right. Now, these um, the Black Bobs that came to this area and there were about a thousand of them under the leadership of Chief Black Bob, they were basically hunters and not farmers. So they loved the wide open land of this area and hunted the buffalo and the deer and the beaver. And, and they did have homes and their homes were basically um, um, mud huts that they lived in. Uh, they did have small farms, but they basically were the hunters. And when they would go out on their hunt, uh, they might be gone two and three months and live in their teepees and then the folks that did not go on the um, uh, uh, hunt uh, remained obviously at home. Now, once these Shawnees came here and there were actually 10 bands of them 
and um, the Black Bob Shawnees, and they're one of those 10, um, named after their great uh, chief, um, they um, lived in this area. And once you had the Native Americans coming to this area, these new immigrants, because what did we do with the other immigrants? We moved them further west. And they were told when they came, these immigrant Indians, this would be their home forever, forever. And the treaties say that. And they didn't uh, even signing a treaty and owning and uh, buying land, as I mentioned to you before, was a foreign concept to them. Well, they soon found out that forever really didn't mean forever. It was a very short time. But what happens is that um, the uh, Shawnee Methodist mission and other missionaries come to this area, Catholic missionaries, Baptist missionaries, to help educate these Native Americans. And of course, one of the main centers was the Shawnee Methodist Mission, which is now located and preserved in Fairway. And they had um, about 20 different Indian tribes that had their children come there and it was a boarding school. And it basically was in existence from 1830 until uh, the beginning of the Civil War, 1862. And the person that started that was Thomas um, Johnson. And that's how Johnson County is named is after this Baptist minister, uh, pardon me, this Methodist missionary that came. He was a very controversial person. He came uh, from the South. He brought his slaves. Um, so he was um, a pro-slave person. Uh, he was uh, helping these Native Americans become educated. And educated meant that they became civilized and we took the Indian out of the Indian. The more English, the more American they were, the better it was, um, it, according to the philosophy of um, the folks that ran this boarding house. Okay, now moving to the next slide. Um, so we have that, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the Shawnees are going to remain here forever, as well as the other immigrant Indians. <coughs> pardon me, no, excuse me. Um, yeah, we obviously talking too much. Okay. <clears throat> so the forever um, ended in um, 1854. And George Manypenny was the commissioner of Indians. And he was ordered by the president to sign 18 treaties with the Native Americans that were living in this area, the area west of the Mississippi, and to um, relocate them and to encourage them to move to Indian territory, which was Oklahoma. And um, what the Native American, what the Shawnees did was they worked out with uh, Many Penny that they would stay in this area, but they would have a special land set aside for them, the reservation, the reserve land. And um, so many Penny agreed to that. There were 200, uh, 167 um, Shawnee males, and they were each given 200 acres of land. But what the Shawnees did was make that land all contingual, uh, all connected. So we can live as hunters, we don't have to live as farmers. And that's, if you multiply 167 by 200, you get 33,400 acres. That reservation is what Stanley and Stillwell is today, okay? It's five miles north and south, starting at um, um, 151st and going down to 199. And then it goes 10 miles east and west going all the way over to the state line and going into uh, Spring Hill and Gardner. That was their reserved land. They could stay here, but they had to stay in that area so they could remain to be hunters. Okay, now also at this time, coming through this area, this great desert, were uh, two trails, the Santa Fe Trail and the Oregon Trail. And the Oregon, the Santa, um, it will go on the next one, okay. So um, the line that goes to the up to the right, uh, left, the left one that goes um, uh, to the nor uh, northwest, that's what I'm trying to say, the long line there. Uh, that's the Oregon, California trail. That was 2000 miles. Those were mostly settlers that came to this area 
and decided that they wanted to go out west where the land was better and there was also uh, a mineral called gold out there. The uh, uh, trail going to the south, the southwest, that was the Santa Fe Trail and that was mostly the um, traders, the economic highway of the time. And so we have a, a number of white people are coming to this area that um, uh, has uh, belonged to the Native Americans. And that started in 1820 and went to um, 1880. Okay, now um, let's go to the next part. Um, this is one of my favorite, favorite pictures. This is the main campsite of Chief Black Bob. Uh, after they were given this reserved land, they were allowed to stay here. Okay, this is at 179th and Antioch. 179th and Antioch. And this is where the uh, Wolf Creek and um, uh, Coffee Creek meet and form the Blue River. And it used to belong to Wayne Hansen. I used to love to go out there and he's now deceased and just stand there. And that was their main camping ground right there. And, and you, it didn't take much of imagination to just imagine the history that was made there that that was their heart and their soul. Um, this area right at 179th and um, uh, Antioch. Okay, moving on to the next one. Okay, very quickly, we're gonna go through the Civil War. I'm uh, obviously talking way too long. Um, so 1854 is important because we have the Many Penny Treaty, okay, that said, oh, we got a little confused on what we meant by forever. We didn't mean <laughs> that you could stay here forever, but you have to move on because we've got white people that need to come here now. And um, 1854 was the beginning of the Civil War. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was of, of, of passed. Kansas was a territory, Nebraska was a territory. And the question was, are they gonna come in as slave states or are they gonna come in as free states? And so someone comes up with the idea, let's let the people of the area decide. That's called popular sovereignty. And so what happens is we have a bloodbath in Canada, it, pardon me, in Kansas, because people from the Northeast decide they're gonna come here, they're gonna populate it, and it's not going to be a slave state. And we have people from Missouri, which is a slave state, even though they did not fight on the south, the side of the South in the Civil War, coming over here and going, we're gonna populate it. And so we have nothing but fighting, bloodshed, burning of homes, incredible, incredible destruction during this period from 1854 to 1861, which continued. And of course, the leader of the abolitionists from the Northeast is John Brown. And that's that wonderful mural that is in the state capitol. And they're just wonderful symbols in there, the rifle in one hand, the Bible in the other, um, the tornado of Kansas in the background. And if you haven't seen it, you must see it. Okay, all right. Now, the Civil War in Kansas was not like the Civil War in Missouri. Kansas really never got in, uh, they got in one major battle, we'll talk about it, but really what they did was they fought this war that kept going on between Missouri and Kansas, Missouri wanting slaves, wanting their neighbors to have be a slave state. And so we have these border ruffians like William Quantrell, who uh, came, he lived actually in Missouri, and he would come across the southern part of uh, Johnson County, and he would burn and he would rob, and he was trying to say, if you want, if you want a free state, then um, you're going to have to deal with us. I mean, we're basically dealing with domestic terrorists. And he would ride through Albury, which is the southern part of, of, of Johnson County, uh, go through Olay, the destruction, killing, murder, robbery. And of course, the big uh, destruction he did was in 1863. Lawrence was a hotbed for uh, anti-slavery um, people. He burned the, uh, the city down. Um, hundreds of people were killed and it was just a, a total disaster. Now, two just very quick stories about uh, the Civil War. Um, as these ruffians and 
of Frank James, Jesse James, who was members of this Quantrail group. Um, they would ride through the southern part of Johnson County, Aubrey, and this gentleman stuck his head out. His name was Mr. Ellis, and he got shot in the head, and a bullet hole lodged in it, and he was uh, shooting at Quantrail and his men. And so Quantrail stops and says, I don't know if I killed that man or not, and I better check on it. So he goes into the house, and he, it's Mr. Ellis, and he knows him, and he says, oh, I didn't know that's who was shooting at me. He says, you got a family, I'm not gonna shoot you, but I hope you get rid of that bullet hole sometime. <laughs> and so what happens is this becomes a famous story in Aubrey that bullet hole Ellis never died from the bullet hole and he was in, uh, saved by Quantrail and not killing him. Now, the other thing that is, uh, if you talk to these old time uh, Stillwell Aubrey people, they always talk about the Aubrey Cemetery, which is at 179th and uh, Antioch, still there. And some of Quantrail's men are buried there. Now, Jesse James and Frank James aren't there. But if you read the stories, they talk about the people that um, Quantrail's people that were killed and buried there. And they were under the big oak tree that was by the white picket fence and good luck on finding it. You know, there's no actual records of them. Okay, All right. Now, um, so what happens is that um, the Civil War occurs and you know, Missouri is much more active in it. We have, um, I always forget his name here, uh, General um, uh, Sterling Price that comes up and he tries to take uh, he's a Confederate leader. He tries to take St. Louis, he fails at that. He tries to take Leavenworth, he fails at that. And then he finally retreats and he goes to Lynn Valley. And that's the famous Battle of Mine Creek, which is probably the most famous uh, um, Civil War battle that was fought. He loses that and returns to Arkansas, a very beaten man, okay? Now, during the Civil War, uh, a lot of the Black Bob Shawnees are living on their land. They don't want to get messed up in this white man's war, man, white woman war. And so what they do is a lot of them go down to Oklahoma and live with their first cousins who are the Cherokees. Um, why they're gone, you know there's going to be a problem because you have empty land. And so people, white people start moving in. And in 1862, you can see that on there, the Homestead Act is passed by Abraham Lincoln that says, we need to settle this area, this Kansas area. And, in, and interesting, I meant, did not mention, in 1861, the beginning of the Civil War, Kansas uh, uh, comes into the Union as a free state, okay? So it fights obviously on the part of the North. But in 1862, Abraham Lincoln says, we've got a lot of immigrants, we got a lot of uh, freed slaves and um, that are gonna be the result of this civil war with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. So we need to have people come settle this area. And if you would come here and settle Kansas, Nebraska, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, you could, um, it's basically was um, a squatter's right. Uh, put up a fence of 160 acres. It's yours if you keep it for five years and put a barn on it, okay? So when the Shawnees come back after the Civil War, uh, because most of them had left, a lot of their land has been overtaken by homestead steaders. Um, and which was legal um, in a sense that uh, they're following the Homestead Act, but obviously violating the Many Penny Treaty of 1854. And, um, and also some of the Black Bobs start selling off their property, their 200 acres, there's misunderstanding. A lot of um, um, uh, uh, illegal deals, I guess that's the nicest way I could say it, uh, of the white person taking advantage of the Native Americans. And so in, if you go down to the very bottom, 1879, so the Civil War ends in 1865, a lot of the Black Bobs come back. They, some of them can still stay on the reservation. There's a lot of um, um, mixture there. But President Hayes says, all Shawnees need to leave this area and go down and live with your uh, cousins, the Cherokee. So the last of the Shawnees, the main group, left here in 1879 being forced out by uh, a presidential act, 
Okay, all right. Now, these are the four, um, I'm going way over. These are the four tribes that are still in uh, the, uh, live on reservations in Kansas. They did not actually move with the Shawnees. And uh, the first three are located just north of um, Atchison. And the fourth one, the Potawatomi is north of uh, Topeka. Okay. All right, now let's do this and we'll do this in 10 minutes or less, okay? And I apologize that I got way carried away. Okay, um, let's go to the, Shaw, the uh, Stanley Park. In 1866, 1866, the day after, or the year after the Civil War, we have a flood of uh, people moving into Kansas. We no longer are fighting a civil war. We've got that Homestead Act that is promising land. And so we have people and um, the three families that are considered the founders of uh, Stanley um, are, uh, and Morris are the McAuffeys. You can see their names at the back on the Dugans and the Looks. And they come and it takes them six weeks to come from Ohio to finally settle in Stanley. What is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful about their settlement here is that Maggie McAuffey, a 14-year-old girl riding in her covered wagon with her family, keeps a diary. And that diary is a firsthand account. And her, uh, it was, it, one of my students, her grandmother, um, grandmother was Maggie McAuffey. And so she brings this diary to school and shows it to me. This is unbelievable, you know, that this, and, and I look at it and I go, I can't believe you have that. And she says, well, it's been in my attic. My mother said, you might want to look at it. Okay. And that's when I knew we had to record this history because it would be lost forever in the attic of somebody's home. And um, that had a tremendous impact on um, doing this. All right, finishing this off very quickly, and I apologize. So Stanley and Morse are founded in 1866, 1866. And those were the three founding uh, families. Um, and if you, and you still hear those names around Stanley and uh, Morse. If you hear a Dugan, they go way back. They're among the original people. So Stanley becomes a, 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 a town in 1872, and they name it after Sir Henry Stanley, who's a famous English explorer who goes to Africa and is looking for Livingston. And you know the story, he runs into Livingston and says, I presume you're Mr. Livingston. Okay, and that was, you know, he was the famous person in 1872. Um, Morris, who, uh, which is five, mi uh, five miles west of Stanley at 151st in Quivira, um, he, there, they, he was, na that name was, it's spelled M-O-R-S-E because they didn't know how to spell Morris, the superintendent of the trains. Trains were big deal at that time. And so they named it after this uh, uh, superintendent of railroads. Okay, flipping through this. This is the railroad. This was a railroad that came through Stanley. It started in uh, Springfield, Missouri, came north, uh, came to Benton, then went uh, through um, Stanley, um, Morris, and then Olathe. That brought a lot of people to this area, that uh, train station. And that was located right where Orman's furniture store is. It would be like 154th and Medcalf, no longer standing there. And right across the street from that was a hotel. And this is a beautiful hotel. It was called the Kellogg Hotel. And unfortunately that has um, uh, been destroyed. But wherever you found a train, you also found a hotel. Okay, moving on. This again is a wonderful picture. This was in 1914 of the general store in Stanley, and I wish I knew the names of those people, but this was the grocery store. This is where you bought things. Uh, it was a th thriving metropolis of a thousand people at that time. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, this is the bank. Um, so you've got a people that is primarily agrarian, but they also have a bank, they have a lumber store, they have a, um, a grain or a, 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 a um, a hardware store, 
um, it becomes a, a, a little town there. Okay, all right. Um, let me just name, I, I wrote them down. Lumber store, drug store, blacksmith store, hotel, meat shop, bank. Okay, um, this is one of the most important things of this community were their churches. Okay, um, their businesses were important their churches were important and their schools were important. I love this picture and this building is still standing. It's like at 151st and Knoll. And if you look at that picture, those are two buildings put together. One is the Methodist church and one is the uh, Baptist church. And they both were individual structures and they put them together and call it the Stanley Community Church because neither one were having much um, uh, attendance and that's that structure is still standing the, the schools were incredibly important to these people every two miles they would build a school uh, and it would be a once a room schoolhouse uh, one uh, first grade to 12th grade they would usually have about 20 people in it it was a community affair someone would give the land someone would give the lumber they would build it and uh, their children would then attend that the Stanley High School, which was open in 1920, it's still standing. It is again about 153rd and Metcalf. It's part of the administration building. They've added on and obviously uh, kept it up. It's a, a very sturdy building, it's a brick build. Okay. Now Moores, which is at 151st and um, Quivira, it's a village that stands on its own. It was started. The McCoffees, McCau uh, the uh, Maggie who wrote the diary, she and her family settled in that area, and it was re uh, uh, established as a, a village in 1884. Both the Santa Fe and Oregon Trail ran through there. Okay, this is the church that's still standing in Morris. It's a functioning church. It's changed hands many times. It's again at uh, 151st and uh, 154th and uh, Quivira. Okay, now quickly going through Aubrey Stillwell. Aubrey was started in 1858, and it was basically people that settled in that area. It was just a small little agrarian community. Okay. And then in 1885, uh, with the Missouri Pacific Railroad going through there on the west side, uh, uh, pardon me, the east side of the area, 199th and Knoll, um, that they combined into one uh, town. Okay. Aubrey was named after a Santa Fe tra trader that was famous. Still, while we go back to our railroad people, he was a famous uh, superintendent of railroads. Okay, uh, this is the railroad uh, Stillwell that is no longer in existence. And of course, right across from it was also a hotel that is no longer there. This is one of the most fascinating um, structures in Stillwell that unfortunately has crumbled in the last two years. It was a famous Stillwell round barn that was at 199th and Knoll. Uh, Mr. Brinkley had this idea that if he built a Brown barn, it would be the best kind to hold his horses in. The stalls were uh, wedge shaped. There were 12 of them. They would fit two horses in each of those. It had all kinds of mechanical things to it, electrical uh, lifts for hay, for food. Um, uh, it was uh, just the top of the line and, and a very innovative idea back in um, the 1880s. Okay. All right. This is uh, one of the pictures. I, I love this. Can you imagine um, uh, uh, <laughs> farming with this kind of equipment? And that's what they used, um, obviously, then. And um, again, uh, one of the wonderful pictures that we took that belonged to uh, Mrs. Cox. Uh, this is Stillwell High School. Um, it's still standing. It's right across from Stillwell Grade School on 199th in um, um, uh, just uh, east of Metcalf. And um, it's been used for many things. It's uh, now vacant. It's uh, been used as uh, mainly as a Stillwell apartment building. And then the last, well, not quite. I thought it was the last. Okay, next to last. Um, churches have always been important to the Stanley folks, to the Stillwell people. And 
this, these two churches are still standing there on Main Street down in the Stillwell area, the Methodist Church and the uh, uh, Baptist Church. Okay, let me finish it off. Okay. And um, sports was always a big thing in these, both of these communities, the Stillwell baseball team, they were big in that as well as the um, basketball. Those were two things. And I love this pictures of these gentlemen. Uh, this would have been in the early 1900s. Okay, I went through that incredibly fast and I apologize, but um, basically um, I, I just wanted to show you it, it, this, we're so fortunate to be living in this area. If we understand the history of Southern Johnson County, we understand the history of the United States and the settlement of the United States, primarily agrarian, where businesses are important, schools are important, and churches and sports are very important. And um, I think I'll end it at that. And at least we have five minutes for questions. <laughs> and and I, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce uh, my helper here. Her name is Phyllis Moore. And uh, if you can put in, yeah. Uh, Phyllis uh, is a teacher at Johnson County Community College in the continuing ed area. And she teaches technology courses. And I am minus 10 in technology and she always helps me with these power presentations. So thank you, Phyllis, for being here. Okay, Lori, I'm ready. All right, thank you, Anita and her uh, sidekick, Phyllis. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Anita, this is Jim. First of all, that was outstanding. Thank mm -hmm. you. And my question mm -hmm. is this, in all of your research, did you ever come across anything that really surprised or even shocked you? Yeah, I, I did. Um, and and I, I guess, and this is negative, and I don't like to be negative, Jim, but um, that night, uh, um, the Homestead Act of 1862, and I, I was reading it last night, it was done by Abraham Lincoln, and he talks about the immigrants that need a new home, and the uh, former black slaves that need a new home. And uh, I go, well, what happened to the Native Americans they need a new home? You know, I, I just went, why? Uh, anyway, I just, I, I was troubled by that. And I, I never really put that together. You know, that we keep moving them west and west and south and, and making promises forever. But um, the words on the paper are not uh, worth, uh, yeah, forever doesn't mean what forever should mean. So that's an answer. I, I had one item, and that is the, the, the painting in the state capitol in Topeka. Mm -hmm. It was actually done by my brother-in-law's uncle, John Stewart Curie. <laughs> wow. And I really enjoyed seeing that uh, picture of John Brown. That was cool. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the most famous picture. Hey, I need it. I didn't know you were so famous, Jerry. <laughs> 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 hey, Anita, you mentioned that 179th and Antioch uh, mm -hmm. campsite. Can can people go out there and, and see it, or is that is it's, it on private it's, property? It's private property. And okay. Wayne Hansen, who used to own it, and he was just a wonderful man. And, and I would just call him and say, I, I just need to come on and get refreshed. And, right. and he'd go, anytime, Anita, just come out. You know you know where I live. And mm -hmm. I, I have no idea who owns that property now. But mm -hmm. uh, it's such a perfect site for mm -hmm. uh, the Native Americans. And that's the same location with the cemetery, too, correct? No, mm -hmm. the cemetery is further south. And, okay. um, and maybe I said it wrong. But it would be, um, um, it's really about um, 99th. Um, uh, let me get that exact address, but it's further south. That's okay. Okay, yeah. Anita, good job. I loved it. I learned a lot of things. I got some exploration I need to do as soon as everybody gets well. Thank you so very much for your time. Yeah. Your well, book, I'm sure, is a key to this thing. It had so much information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really and, uh, I'll be, uh, uh, I, I want to say this, and, and I, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but um, I'm so grateful to the college. When they gave me a sabbatical in 2005, I go, oh, come on, who cares about this history? And somehow I want to update my little book here, you know? And they couldn't have been more supportive. And, and I was very insistent, and that has continued to happen, that uh, they sell this book for $15 in the bookstore. And all the money goes to a special fund to help students that are in need. And, and 
I've always said, this is not any kind of financial uh, deal with me. It's just sharing this wonderful history with um, uh, Johnson County folks. And uh, I'm very proud of that. And so I'm very book, appreciative of this. Is that book still for sale? Today? Yeah, it is. And I, I want to tell you that I've written these three books now, you know, the Stanley one, the Stillwell one, and then put them all together. And I, unfortunately, I have to tell you, none of them have hit the New York bestseller. <laughs> and and I, I can tell you, I'm finished writing books, even though this was such a wonderful project. Oh, yeah. Do we have any other questions for Anita? Anita? Yes. Uh, this is Joanne Rodkey, and I just wanted to tell you that this was a great hour. I really loved it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I have a, a double problem, as you all know. I, um, I'm a teacher, and I'm also an attorney, and I love to hear myself talk, and especially <laughs> with a captive audience. So thank you for giving me an hour of your time. All right, I think we're finished, Laurie. We'll let people go. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Anita, for your wonderful presentation. Hey, Anita, I have one more question for you, if you can take it. Others can go ahead and go away. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> Outside I know you love Baldwin, history, Jim. I'm glad you're here. I'm getting into it. Outside of Baldwin, there is a park there. And we were there one time years ago. There was an, an actor there, a reenactor. He uh -huh. was claiming that that's where the Civil War actually started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or anybody else is, but it's an evil park. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that. Uh, I mean, all I hear is the Civil War really began with the pr passing of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and then the Jayhawkers, which were the uh, anti-slavery people fighting the border ruffians, which were, um, you know, Quantrell and his group, you know, and they kept going across uh, southern Johnson County and, and their biggest damage was done to, uh, in 1863 in Lawrence. But uh, I don't know that history, and that's interesting. I'd like to follow up on that. And Jim. Hey, hey, Jim, I've been to I've been to that little park, and it's basically where the first supposedly first battle was. Yes, of the Civil exactly. War is with some John Brown folks and some yep. folks from Missouri. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And, yeah. And tell me again. Park, tell park. me again, Jim. Where is it at? It's, well, it, as you're going into Baldwin on Highway 56, mm -hmm. uh, probably a mile or so out of town, it's off to the left. I think it's marked if you. I think you can see the sign for the okay. little park. Is that okay. right, Dave? Yeah, you can see it. And it's not a really big park, but it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's fun to walk around. It's yeah. kind of like that, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, that battleground you were talking about. So, or I mean, the campsite. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, Baldwin isn't that big, so I'm sure I could find it. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, as soon as um, I uh, become uh, more active in this uh, COVID-19 <laughs> era. But thank you for that information, Jim. So, I, have, uh, I, have, I have a question for Lori. I noticed, yes. that this, I noticed that this was recorded. How do we access that recording to show it to another person? Well, um, I'm going to record it, then I'm going to send it to Jonathan. Okay. And Jonathan's going to make that happen. All right, thank you. So we have, I don't know if all of you know, we have a JCCC YouTube channel. And again, thanks to Jonathan. Um, where he is trying to um, get all of these all of these sessions that we've been doing recorded, and then once he has them all, you know, edited and whatnot, then he's putting them on the YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. It has it has the RA on it though, Lori. The JCCC RA YouTube. I, I think it yes, JCCC RA YouTube. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that, is Debbie on here? Yeah, Debbie, I, I apologize. And I should have mentioned Lori and Debbie have been very instrumental in having me give this presentation. And uh, I have to admit, I said to Debbie, you know, there'll be three of us there, you know, you and me and maybe one other person. And um, Debbie said, no, no, please do it. Please do it. And, and Debbie has been very uh, supportive of this as Lori has, and I appreciate it. Well, Anita, have you know, you have 22 people on this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.